Welcome back everyone. Today we're talking about frame analysis. This builds on what we did in lesson three on truss analysis. So check that out first and then come right back here. Today we're going to consider a simple two dimensional frame shown over here. We'll have one beam, two columns. Notice our boundary conditions are a pin on this side and we'll have a fixed end down here. We'll have a hinge located at this beam to column connection right here. Our material will be structural steel and we'll be using a standard AISC shape, a W18 by 106 for all of the shapes here and they'll be bent in the strong axis. As usual, we'll be starting in the workbench. Let's pull over a geometry and we'll start there. In space claim, the first thing that I'll do is I'll check my units. This problem was described in feet, but we can use feet or inches and a lot of times inches is going to be more convenient. So let's check our units. It's metric here, I'll change that to imperial, and I'll leave that in inches, but you are able to change this to feet or feet in inches if you wish. I'll leave that as inches. We'll say okay. I'll select my sketch plane, I'll sketch in the XY plane as usual. Get my plan view. Remember, since we want to sketch lines and not a shape, I'm going to click layout sketch right over here. And that prevents me from sketching any surfaces, so it's lines only. I'll start at the origin, I'll go 12 feet up. Again, this is in inches, but you can actually just do multiplication straight in the input there. So I can do 12 multiplied by 12 and hit enter. And that will give you 12 feet or 144 inches there. It goes 18 feet over, so I'll do 18 times 12. And then it went 18 feet down, so 18 times 12. I'll hit escape and I'll go back into my 3D view. And there is my sketch. The next thing I need to do is assign my section. So we'll go to the work, excuse me, the prepare. We'll check profiles. We don't have any profiles by default. The section that I'll be doing is the AISC standard section here. So we'll go to standard library AISC and we're doing a W18. So we'll scroll down to W18 by 106. So there it is. We'll click over so that it puts it into the selected cross sections and I'll hit import. Now that will import it as an available cross section of my model. So I'll go here, I'll select my cross section. And then I'll select all the lines that I want to assign to that cross section and I'll hit create. So now all those lines are assigned this W18 by 106 cross section, but I don't know which way they're oriented. And you can click this button to reorient or change your beam orientation. But first it's more convenient to hit display here and click solid beams so you actually know where these things are facing. So in this case, I'll rotate this around so you can see it a little bit better. And I'll zoom in. So you can see that these are actually oriented on their weak axis for bending. So if I'm putting a vertical load here and a horizontal load, those are weak axis bending. So I want to orient those to strong axis. So I'll click orient here. You have to select each individually and double click on this little rotational arrow here. And that will rotate your beam orientation as such. And so we'll do that for all three of them. So now everything is oriented in the strong axis. I'll turn the display off just to the wire beam model, just so it's easier to see. And the next thing that we'll do is we'll go to workbench. We'll share. There should be two nodes, one, two, that will share. I'll click the check mark. You'll notice everything changes color. These two columns are orange, that means only one of their sides has effectively been fixed to another, another beam. That's okay, because again, the bottoms here are going to be fixed using our boundary conditions. And that's it for the geometry, so let's head back. Now we'll link up a static structural analysis. Let's pull that over, link it to our geometry. For now, we'll still stick with the default engineering data since I'm using structural steel, so I can go straight to my model. In ANSYS Mechanical, let's check a couple things first. First, I'll double check my units. We'll go home, units right here. I can see units US customary in inches, pounds. That's great, so we'll leave that. That's consistent with what we did before. You'll also notice if you're observant that it's also down here and you can change your units down here as well if you want. Next thing is I'll check my cross sections. Let's click display. I'll click on the cross sections right here and I see that, yep, that looks pretty great. That's exactly what I had defined before. So I'll turn those off for now. Let's start off with a mesh. So I'll click geometry here, expand that out, go to my beam. We can see that we have a beam model type. That is in fact correct for this type of analysis. 
So previously we had done a link or truss, which only carries axial force. In this case, we're going to use a beam. Beams are unique in that they have both rotational and translational degrees of freedom, so they can carry moments and shear and axial force simultaneously. So we'll keep that as beam. For the cross section, by default, this is pre-integrated. I'm gonna change this to mesh. So a meshed cross section will be able to generate stresses and strains when it's a beam, whereas a pre-integrated section, though perhaps more efficient, will not give you stresses or strains. So we'll change that to mesh. I'll go to my mesh here. And first I'll decide on my sizing. So let's size. I'll do a box select and I'm gonna select all of my edges right here. Drag a box around them. Apply that to my geometry. And let's say my element size is about six inches here. So we'll do six. And then I'm going to generate my mesh. So it's generated a mesh. It doesn't look like it's done much. Go back to display. You can click thick beams and shells so that you can see the mesh on your cross section. And that looks pretty awesome. I usually like to hide that until I'm ready to go because you can't actually do anything with this visual representation of the cross section. So let's turn that off just so I'm editing the line only because that's the only thing you can actually select and, and modify. Now what I'd like to do is apply a hinge at this connection right here. So by default, you'll remember we merged these elements together in space claim and that will merge all their degrees of freedom. So it merges rotations and translations. But at a hinge, our rotation should be free so that we have zero moment at that location. So what we need to do there is we need to create a new connection. Now you won't see it over here. So right click on model and go insert connections. And that gives us a connections option. We'll go to our context menu for connections and I want to create an end release. So for the end release, let's select the edge that I want to release. I want to release my top edge here. So I'll select the top edge and I will apply that. And I want to release this node over here. So we'll select a node, that one right there. And that's my vertex geometry. Now the release that I want to do is my rotation about the Z axis. So Z axis right now is coming out of plane. So it's going this way and that will release my moment for that particular direction. So I will double click on this that changes it from fixed to free or you can use the drop down box that does the same thing. And so now I've put a hinge at that location right there. Now that we've done a release, let's put some boundary conditions and force on this. For boundary conditions, we'll click static structural I want a simply supported boundary condition. That's a little bit misleading. What it actually does is it fit, fixes all of your translation degrees of freedom, but none of your rotational degrees of freedom. So it's not a technical roller, it's actually a pin right at that location right there. And then I also want a fixed connection on this right side over here. So we'll apply that. Fixed connections will fix all degrees of freedom, translations and rotations. Finally, I need to apply some loads You'll remember I had distributed loads along this column and along this beam here, and they were specified in kips per foot. If I create right here a line pressure, that will allow me to do a load per unit length. So I'll click here and I'll apply and I'll change this to components. And it wants me to put in my force as a pounds per inch. If you don't like doing conversion, you can avoid this. In this case, it's not that hard. I had 1.2 kips per foot. We'll divide that by 12 and multiply it by a thousand to get that in pounds per inch. So in this case, it's gonna be a hundred pounds per inch. But if you're lazy and you don't like conversions, you can actually change your units just for this part. So I'll change it to feet. And then we'll notice I have 1200 pounds per foot and that works exactly as I had defined it. And I'll do the same thing up here. So I'll create, select that, I'll create another line pressure. It's being applied to this top edge and I'll define that as components and it will be negative uh, 1600 pounds per foot down. So if I change my units back to inches, it will automatically do the conversion for me right here. So it's 133.33 pounds per inch or 100 pounds per inch right over here. So that will work out very nicely for you if you don't like unit conversions. So let's go to solution here. I want beam section results. So let's turn that on, say yes, and hit solve. And it's done. So let's get a couple results. 
So since I have beam section results and I have also defined a mesh cross section for my beam, I can already get stresses and strains out of this problem. So let's get a uh, directional displacement. I'll say displacement in the X direction. Let's get a stress. We'll do a normal stress, normal stress in the X axis. That will be the typical stress that's generated under beam bending and axial forces. Let's also get a couple beam results. I would like an axial force and I would like a bending moment. Next thing I'd like is some reaction forces. So normally you can go to probe here and you can probe for a force reaction or a moment reaction. Another thing that you can do is you can just take your reaction right here and you can click and drag it down to your solution. So if I click and drag that simply supported reaction down there, it'll create a force reaction at that location. I can do the same thing for my fixed support. I can click and drag it down and it created a force reaction too. Now it did not create a moment reaction there. So you'll still have to go to your probe and create a moment reaction for my fixed support to make sure that that actually properly is computed. All right, and that should be good. So let's hit solve and we'll, we'll get our results. Let's look at our directional deformation and I'll click on the Z axis because really everything is just happening in 2D here. So this was my displacement in the X direction. I have about 0.3 inches of displacement at the top of this frame. Normal stresses, we can see that compression is going to be blue, tension is going to be red. So I have compression here on the top, tension on the bottom, also tension over here and compression over here. And you could probe those values if you like. So I can see I have a compression of about 5,300 PSI there and a tension of about 4,400 PSI at the other end of that. I can check my axial forces. Here, the axial force is uniform in each of those. That's because I haven't applied a self-weight here. I only have a distributed load along this column and along this beam, so those results make sense. That's good. Now for bending moments, right now I'm looking at a total bending moment. If you have bending in two directions, this is effectively your biaxial moment. In this case, we only have moment in one direction. So I can change this if it helps to make it a little bit more clear from a total bending moment to a directional bending moment or you can look at y-axis or z-axis. So don't be confused by these. Y-axis and z-axis moments are actually local coordinate systems, so it can be a little bit confusing. It does not relate to this y and this z here in our global coordinates. So for this particular section, y-axis bending is the moment that's going to be around the strong axis. Z-axis is the weak axis bending for these particular sections. So I actually want my Y-axis, that's my strong axis bending for this particular section here. I'll hit solve. You'll notice the results basically don't change because if I look at my Z moments, if I change that to Z-axis moment, they are effectively zero for all practical purposes along my entire section. So they're very, very, very small. So this is rounding errors of the method. So I'll change that back to my Y moments. So those are my strong axis moments. Last thing we'd like to do, let's see if we can actually get a moment diagram for each of these locations. So what I'm going to do is go to solution here, beam results and shear moment diagram. So for the shear moment diagram, I need to define a path over which it's going to draw the moment diagrams. So what I'm gonna do is go up to the top, we'll go to model, Path is in construction geometry right here. So we will create a path. And I'll just do a path over the entire arch of this structure. So instead of doing a path type of two points, I'm going to do a path type of edge. I'll select all the edges. So I'll make a box select. I'll drag around the whole thing. And I'll apply that to my geometry. And you can see now my path is going to start here at one and go around down to two. So now let's go to our shear moment diagram. I can define my path, which is just named path here. And what I'd like to do is I would like to change my type. So it's going to give me my directional shear and moment. In this case, my Y moment was the interesting moment. So that was my strong axis bending. So I'll get my shear Z, so the VZ and my moment Y. For my graphics display, let's change this to the bending moment in the Y direction, and then we'll hit solve. All right, so when you do this, it's going to bring up these diagrams for you. You see this first one is our shear in the Z direction and my bending moment in the Y direction. So this is the bending moment in that strong axis. 
and its associated shear force. You'll notice something rather interesting that my shear force is actually following these steps. Even though I applied a load per unit length, you'd expect that shear to vary linearly. The reason it does this is that the distributed load in ANSYS is applied as a series of point loads at each of the nodes in your element. So if you have a more dense mesh, this is going to look closer to a truly distributed load. If you don't like the looks of that, you can always do something right over here where you can change your display option to from unaverage to averaged. Then you notice it'll give you smooth lines for your shear diagram. This is a little bit misleading because ANSYS did not not actually calculate this. These are just averaged values. And so I actually prefer not to leave, not to average it because this is more true to what the finite element method has actually given you and done for you. So it is actually applying it as a series of point loads. So let's leave it like this. It's actually more true to what's going on in the model. If you want to see this as a visual on your geometry itself, you can click from worksheet down here over to geometry and we can see a little nice little line diagram showing our beam structure with color coding for our moments that we have here. Now, just as we'd expect, we see that there's effectively zero moment down here at the pin connection. That's good. It's within a rounding error of zero. And also we see zero moment up here at the hinge, which means we've defined that correctly. And that gives me some confidence in these results. So that's all for frame analysis for today. Please subscribe and I'll see you next time.